who uh, uh, worked this was Eva McGuire. How many people here have met Eva McGuire or know her? Let's have a round of applause for Eva McGuire. <laughs> One of the, if you, not many people have known her, understand that uh, the reason why I'm standing here at this podium is that she does not take no for an answer. And it simply <laughs> became easier to say, yes, I will go. Uh, and uh, how many people were out at the airport uh, yesterday and uh, got, a, got a chance there? I had, uh, that was, if you're not an aviation person, you don't know that that was a rarity of an event at an airport because uh, I've been an airport manager before and the airport manager's job is fraught with the city, the FAA. It is the worst job in the entire world. And you rapidly learn that the magic answer is no. And to find an airport manager uh, uh, like the one we had who said, yes, please drive cars out on the ramp. Uh, I, I would like this. Uh, I, I will uh, not disclose that that's technically against FAA regulations, but we had a great time, didn't we? Uh, uh, and a lot of people said uh, uh, to Scott Jefferson, who was the airport manager, hey, that was great. And they came up to me and said, uh, William, thank you. You really found the right airport manager. Okay, full disclosure, I did not find that guy. Even McGuire found that guy. And I tried to explain to her that no is the magic answer from airport managers. And she said, I'll just call some people. And about two days later, she said, call this man. And that's how we got the airport manager we have. So uh, one of the things, of, if you know Eva, one of the things about her is that uh, uh, in a year of COVID, she's highly unlikely to be able to attend this with us and I did not notice in any way, shape, or form that it dampened her enthusiasm for contributing to the event, which struck me as selfless and truly in the spirit of the things that make events like this better, which is people willing to put back more than they took out. So let's have a round of applause for her. Uh, while we're at it, uh, if uh, I have to say, uh, uh, Mike Hall uh, has been uh, very gracious to me in particular, and uh, uh, I think I had uh, very little interaction with him, and he had great trust that I would actually be here and show up and we would have a good time. And uh, if he uh, had reservations about it, he did not convey them. Uh, and uh, I, I think a guy with uh, that level of cool under pressure putting on a big event like this deserves a round of applause. So. Uh, for, for me, coming here, uh, I've actually, although I'm a Corvair, Corvair airplane guy, I've also been a Corvair uh, uh, car driver for an awful lot of years. I had a 67 uh, Monza forever and ever. I've had, uh, had a 67 Monza convertible. I've had the same 66 Corsa convertible uh, for an awful lot of years. I had a 65 Greenbrier Deluxe. Uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. Uh, <laughs> I had never met many people. I know the names, but if you're out in the hinterlands of Florida, you don't know people uh, by face. So I came here and met a lot of people who I had only known. And just one simple example of only knowing somebody by uh, their literature, their writing, their content. I did not know I was standing next to Larry Claypool. <laughs> and uh, that, it was uh, great to have a chance to, to meet him. And, the ultimate phenomenon of your memory is, I can't remember exactly what I thought Larry Claypool looked like before yesterday, but it wasn't who I met. And what, <laughs> but the reality replaces uh, the person you had in your mind. But the interesting thing is, I could hear his voice in every, uh, every single article that I read on what stock is over the years in the course of communicate. And, and I will confess that uh, amongst my friends in Corvairs, we used to uh, have an informal column that never actually got sent into the communique called, What Stock Isn't? But <laughs> we figured that people didn't need any instruction in that. Uh, but uh, it, it was a, a pleasure meeting a lot of uh, people I had not 
gotten to know in person. And there is no substitute for events like this and meeting people in person. Social media, online, great stuff, but nothing beats uh, meeting people in person. It smooths over all miscommunications and misunderstandings. And again, this is a reason to be very thankful for the people who put the hard work in here. Okay, uh, I saw a show of hands before about how many people would like to, uh, or had been out to the airport. Uh, and this is just a, we had had this idea many, many years before. Uh, if you work in aviation, the BCAD of aviation is 9-11 for a lot of reasons. But airport security had changed so much, even at little airports. Finding an airport uh, like uh, Shelbyville County Airport, where you can still go in and there are not gate cards and barbed wire and concertinas and, and cameras, uh, that's, a, that's not a rarity. But finding a, a place like that that's also open to the general public and available to us to do this stuff, this, these don't grow on trees anymore. That used to be the pre-9-11 world of airports, but not post-9-11. So this is a really good combination. And what I had a lot of people say to me was, would it be possible to do this again, uh, perhaps next year? The overwhelming answer from the pilots are, absolutely. So what say the car people? Would, uh, does this seem like a great event that we would like to perhaps do again? Andrew? I have a lot of social media stuff that uh, people with the, uh, with the Corvair pilots do. And all those guys in, went home and they posted pictures and everybody from the world of Corvair powered flight was stunned at the amount of cars that showed up. And seeing them intermixed like that, it was absolutely great. I will confess that uh, Elizabeth and I drove up all night from Florida and as the hours went by, and uh, we had just launched a, an airplane out of my hangar in Florida. We had a weather delay. We sent him, and I thought, hmm, 26 hours till we have to be there. It's only 1,000 miles. Uh, no problem. They, they sell plenty of coffee along the way, if I understand it. So we, uh, we uh, came up, and as the hours got later, I thought, the perennial thing after 32 years of doing this, the general fear creeps in, and it's, Nobody's going to show up. I know it's going to be terrible. All those car people will show up, but none of the airplane people will make it in. Then I got word from the airplane guys that they had arrived and we had a bunch. And then I thought, what if none of the car people come? And then we had, then we had the, the multicolored band showed up. Uh, the uh, green Lakewood showed up. And I thought, two. This is more than we had hoped for. <laughs> and, I, and I said to uh, Scott Jefferson, the airport manager, let's, let's, what if we bring him inside the fence? Which is asking one airport manager to another, I would like you to break about a half a dozen federal regulations, and we're going to take pictures when we do it. <laughs> Getting a guy to agree to this is really, it's like, would you like to commit a felony with me? <laughs> we'll be cellmates. <laughs> uh, but uh, he said sure, and uh, we gingerly brought in one or two, and then the, and then the, then there was uh, 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 Yanko Stinger showed up, and I thought, geez, I've never even seen a Yanko Stinger in person in my life. We'll bring this one out. That's three. That's not too many pictures. And pretty soon we had a steady stream of cars, and I looked over at Scott, and I gave him the. What do you think? And from 50 yards away, he said, thumbs up. And I thought, that's a great cellmate to have. <laughs> so uh, the, the pilots, I'll assure you, uh, love this. Uh, and they thought it was uh, great. Uh, switching gears a little bit here, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on how I came to uh, work with Corvair Powered Airplanes. Uh, uh, I went to a school called Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. How many people have ever heard of this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I went to Emory Riddle Aeronautical University, and I will mild, mildly say, without apology to uh, people who went to other schools, it is the finest aviation school in the entire world. And, uh, uh, it, and that's about as modest as people from Emory Riddle get. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I went there, uh, I arrived and 
I uh, came from a, a military aviation family, and I knew a lot about airplanes in advance. And I basically went there because I thought, somebody's gonna design a replacement for the SR-71, and I'd like to be on that team. That was the engineering thought I had at the time. And very oddly, I left the school, or within maybe a year or two at the school, I decided that I was much more interested in a branch of aviation called experimental aviation. And experimental aviation is home-built aircraft. And every airplane you have ever seen, every airplane that you've ever seen with a Corvair in it is an experimental aircraft. And that is meant that it is a non-commercial airplane without being FAA type certificated. Those are the only airplanes. So when you look at those airplanes that have Corvair engines on it, every one of them was, was built by somebody at home. And this branch of aviation really appealed to me. This was the creative aspect of it, uh, and it was, uh, it, its particular appeal to me uh, was that the, you, were, you were not a small cog in it. You could make a contribution, and you could be a participant to it. I sort of thought when I got to Embry-Riddle that most people would become, even if you were engineers, you would be a pilot. Uh, and I found out rapidly that a lot of people uh, were not that way, but I kind of had that feeling that I, Aviation was too exciting to uh, uh, have a role inside an office building. So I knew I would be involved in this. And if people say, who do you have to thank for uh, going with Corvairs instead of something else? And truly, as I was an airframe and power plant mechanic uh, very rapidly, and I went over to the 1989 Sun and Fun Air Show in Lakeland, Florida, second largest air show in the world. Uh, and they had a giant displays from every manufacturer there. And as an A&P mechanic, you're expected to be an expert on Lycoming, Continental, and all the certified engines. And there was the Teledyne Continental Motors booth from Mobile, Alabama, with all these impeccably dressed guys all standing there. And at the time, in 1989, allegedly for product liability reasons, Continental no longer made any of their smaller engines. They had legendary engines at 65, 75, 85, and 100 horsepower that trained legions of pilots, but they didn't make them anymore. And they said, oh, there's too much liability in making engines for training airplanes and so on and so forth. And I went there, they were still making plenty of engines, like, uh, you know, 520 cubic inch uh, uh, turbocharged geared uh, Gitsu motors that were, in 1989, the motors were 80 and $100,000. So I went and asked a guy there and said to him, uh, uh, if, do you still have the capability of making an 85 or 100 horsepower affordable engine? And he said, oh yes, Teledyne Continental can make any engine they ever made. We have the capability in-house to do that. And I said, you, well, you make the expensive stuff for the rich people, uh, why don't you make stuff for the mechanics who are supposed to be experts in servicing your products in the field. And he looked both ways and made sure no one was there. <laughs> and he leaned across the table and said to me, because Teledyne Continental Motors does not give a blank about people like you. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, okay, uh, 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 I, I don't like that answer, but I thought, <laughs> I, I thought to myself, that might be one of the few occasions where a rep for a major corporation would actually tell you the absolute truth. And I thought, you don't punish people for telling you the truth, even when you don't like it. And from that day, I went back to Embry-Riddle, and I sat down and said, if I'm going to have a seat at the table, I'm going to have to make the chair. That was, that was the thought. And I had, no, I had been a Chevy guy my whole life. Uh, I'll confess that uh, uh, I owned uh, two Buicks and a GMC truck and everything else I've ever owned and driven as a Chevrolet. So I'm kind of brand loyal like that. <laughs> but uh, I, I knew about Corvairs, but I had done a lot of stuff in, in, in uh, small blocks and big blocks. And I looked at it and I thought, I will build this chair because I am going to be in this game and I am not going to say, oh, that's just the way that it is. When somebody says, all the rich guys can have all the toys, but you can't. Uh, so that, I, that one random guy who I failed to note his name 
and he may be retired by now. Uh, silently, I uh, thank him for that. The Corvair, after I looked at all the options, was the best uh, power to weight ratio of any of the available engines. And I did my homework and looked at it, and strangely enough, there's a very interesting connection here. What year do you think the first year a Corvair powered airplane flew was? How long from the start of production to the first airplane flying on a Corvair was? 1960. 1960. 1960 is the magic answer. Do, does anybody know who the first guy to fly a Corvair powered airplane was? It was, who said Pete Paul? Okay, correct answer. A, a guy from Cherry Grove, Minnesota, named Bernard Petenpohl, uh, went to his Chevy dealer in Preston, Minnesota, ordered a replacement engine in 1960, and in uh, May of, of 1960, he put that engine on the front end of a J3 Cub and flew, flew that. And so his, that's how far, almost as long as we've had the cars, there have been Corvair-powered airplanes. Over the years, there have been close to uh, I'm, I'm going to say 750 Corvair powered airplanes have taken flight. It's not a ton, but it's a significant, it's not enough to win World War II, let's say, but it, it's, enough, it's enough to win your heart and loyalty. Uh, Bernard Petenpohl had an interesting background. He lived from 1902 to 1984. I got in aviation just after the man passed. Uh, I got to know many of his family members, and once you know something about the history of home-built airplanes, you learn about the man who is the patron scene of home building. The most interesting thing about him was he put the Corvair on the front end of a J3 when he was 58 years old. Uh, what had he done earlier? He was the first guy ever to fly a Ford Model A engine in an aircraft, and he did that in 1928. Now, here's the interesting connection between the, here's the interesting connection. Uh, if you know the history, how many people saw the film The Great Waldo Pepper? Re remember Robert Redford and The Great Waldo Pepper? It's a story of barnstorming, but it's an incredibly accurate history of barnstorming. And in a nutshell, barnstorming, the US built uh, several thousand training planes, jetties, and they were available military surplus and they, they were sold to barnstormers. And they were $200 in a crate for an entire airplane. And that went on until 1926. And the barnstorming era ended like that. And the reason why it ended like that was a newly found federal organization, the Civil Aviation Authority, passed a regulation and said the jetties were in too terrible condition, there had been too many accidents. So light airplane flying ended in the United States in 1926, except for wealthy people, except for wealthy people. Now, uh, your typical aviator who didn't care that the jetties were gone was uh, say Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes could afford any airplane and the least expensive airplane went from $200 to about 6,000 in one month in 1926. The only option for affordable flying was somebody had to figure out how you were going to put a car engine in an airplane. And the guy who did this was not some research scientist. He was very much like the Wright brothers. He lived in Cherry Grove, Minnesota, and produced this. This is Bernard Petenpohl when he is uh, 26 years old. When he's 58 years old, he puts a Corvair on the front end of an airplane because he thinks airplane engines are getting too expensive. So roll up to 1989, and you get me, who is told that airplane engines are too expensive, and that you're going to be a spectator. If you work and get your hands dirty, your role is to be a spectator. And we've been told this lots of times. Now, I consider it un-American to accept that you have a job because you have dirty hands, you are to be a spectator. I, I absolutely consider that uh, against the grain of being an American. So Bernard Petenpohl, he did, Bernard Petenpohl in 1926 did not care that Howard Hughes was spending his time and money on airplanes, it was fine. He was not against Howard Hughes joining the Mile High Club with Gene Harlow or anything else that he was doing. 
However, uh, he wanted his seat at the table, even if he had to make the chair. And uh, in the same way, I picked up the baton in 1989 to do much the same thing. If you want to hear something uh, very, very interesting is that this is a home-built aircraft, and the idea of building your own engine is a worldwide desire, but it is something that 99% of it is done right here in America. So the central message of all of this stuff, of the history of aviation right here is that uh, if, would you rather be in the arena or would you rather be a spectator? And unfortunately today, as we look around, not the people in this room, because the people in this room say, I would like to have, I would like to be in the arena, whatever we're building or doing. But if you look at the people uh, in America today, unfortunately, too many people are spectators. Would be people basically agree with that? Yeah. That, that we have unfortunately become a society of spectators when we are born from generations of people who are, their desire to be, as Teddy Roosevelt put it, was in the arena instead of a, as a spectator or a critic. Now, uh, over at the airport, the one thing that people have always, uh, that I've said that sort of resonated with people was, uh, and I, I forgive, forgive me in advance if uh, anybody in the room owns a Honda, but I'm gonna tell this anyway. Uh, when, I, when I first got started at this, uh, I met a guy and he said to me, uh, I, I can't believe you're working on Corvair motors. Corvair motors are stupid and they're horrible, and I'm going to uh, teach people that a Honda engine is the best engine in the entire world. And, and I thought, I love Corvairs, but maybe everybody doesn't. Maybe I'm some sort of very different guy. Maybe he's got a point. You know, Honda has tons of advertising, and Chevrolet hardly acknowledges that they built Corvairs. And uh, I thought, maybe my love for this is blinding me to how easy of acceptance. But I toiled on for about a year doing research and development. I went to the first air show that I went to, brought my Corvair powered airplane there and showed it to everybody and thought, wonder how many Honda fans are gonna be here criticizing this. <laughs> and what I found out was that at any air show you go to, half the people have a Corvair story, uh, about a quarter of them owned a Corvair, and uh, everybody has a Corvair story that they want to share. And we went through the entire thing. And at the end of the day, the guy who listened to this, uh, who was sitting there, I, I said to him, you know, I was frankly afraid people wouldn't like Corvairs or have fond memories of them. And I thought, you know, and I told him the story about the guy who predicted that this would be a disaster and it would all Honda engines were what it was about. And the guy who was a little bit older, who had told me his own Corvair story, said, it's simple. A Corvair is a machine, and a Honda is an appliance. <laughs> and nobody in their right mind is nostalgic about an appliance they own. <laughs> so from that day forward, I thought, that's really the difference is, uh, I've looked at many things, and uh, you can love a machine, and you can uh, work with it for years, but if you, if anybody said to you, uh, I have an appliance that I love, you would suggest they seek mental care. <laughs> and uh, over the years of working out a lot of technical problems that I'll be glad to talk to people about separately later on or whatever else you're interested in from a nuts and bolts perspective, uh, the most common question I get is people say, you must be a really smart guy to have done this. And uh, I have heard this many times. And I want to share with you the secret of my success in this is, uh, is not being a genius, because I'm most certainly not a genius. Uh, that's not the secret. The secret of my success was being just dumb enough not to know when to quit. Uh, and that's an important uh, aspect of this. I had plenty of people counsel me that this wouldn't work, starting with Mr. Honda, who I will be pleased to report went bankrupt not long afterwards. Um, <laughs> And that would be spiteful of me to bring up, but I do it all the time anyway. Uh, but uh, the secret of, of the success of this is much the same. How many people here have restored a Corvair from the ground up? Okay. Have plenty of people tell you it was a bad idea? You got neighbors, family members, relatives? Uh, sure. Everybody told you it was a bad idea. 
So, uh, and financially, when you added up the bills when you were done, uh, you'd have a hard time justifying it to an accountant. Uh, but uh, fortunately, you don't lead your life to please your accountant, at least I don't. And, uh, uh, and it just has to make sense to you. It has to be the right thing for you to do. And airplanes are pretty much the same way. So there's a certain uh, secret of the success of any long-term venture, which is, uh, to me anyway, which is being just dumb enough not to know when to quit. Now there's, there's some technical stuff. Uh, the reason why Corbair's worked uh, was I was trained at the temple. Embry-Riddle is the temple of Lycoming and Continental, amongst other things. And uh, when I worshipped everything about Lycoming and Continental, except I found out I could not tithe at the temple of Lycoming and Continental. But I did copy all the things of their layout, their simplicity, quality control, manuals, testing, and uh, all, all of it, including all the FAA regulations that we could apply. Uh, but this is the secret of the success was I used a particular format and uh, real training for this. I never winged it. We always, uh, I never used people as guinea pigs. Uh, we had uh, a, a lot of tough days. Uh, I'm, I've uh, lived through two airplane crashes. Uh, thankfully, I've never uh, been responsible for anybody uh, getting hurt any worse than myself. And, uh, and but, uh, uh, persevere on it was uh, I important. Uh, the common thread, when we get down to it, is uh, between Air Corvair airplane people and guys who build home built airplanes themselves and Corvair car people that I've found after uh, uh, going to air shows for 30 years with, with Corvair powered airplanes is it's open minded people. Now, as Corvair people, uh, who, who has a brother-in-law who, who reminds you of Ralph Nader's book every time you see him in your car? Uh, we all do, right? If you think that, if you think that it's uh, bad having people, telling people that you have a Corvair and listening to pathetically narrow-minded naysayers, try telling them that you're building an airplane at home <laughs> with a Corvair engine in it. And, uh, you know, so you have to be independent, and you have to, and, and this is a critically important thing that gets to be less and less common in our society, is you have to be not concerned with the opinions of other people on how you're to lead your own life. And if I took a look at everybody in this room, and we got everybody to share one story about decisions they made, the common thread of people in the land of Corvairs that that we all have in common is you decided that you were going to find your own path through life, make your own evaluations and your own decisions, and very, very low in the order of things was, what will other people think about me doing this? Just not, uh, that, that's the <coughs> fundamental thing. And also, you have to be somebody who enjoys a little bit of mischief. Uh, there, you, Everybody here understands the slightly guilty pleasure of horrifying people who are, uh, uh, you know, weak and subjected to uh, media misconceptions, correct? <laughs> How many people have given a ride in their car when their friends said, wow, this is a neat Camaro, and then you drove around and then parked it and then said to them, it was a Corvair, that's right. <laughs> uh, and it's a little, a little bit of uh, fun uh, mischief. My compadre Dave right here. Uh, how many people saw the Lamborghini uh, that, that came to the uh, airport? Guy driving around the Lamborghini when we got 50 or 60 Corvairs there. And he's, he did two laps around because he clearly wanted someone to say, hey, nice Lamborghini, right? What makes you a Corvair person? What makes you a Corvair person? I'll tell you what makes Dave a Corvair person. Dave goes over and says, does this kit car have a Corvair motor in it? <laughs> so, so uh, yes, that, that, this gentleman right here is the prankster that did that on all our behalf, and I would like to thank him for it. The guy with the Lamborghini drove away. He didn't come back. I wonder why. So, uh, and, and I have uh, 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 plenty of other friends in the, in the airplane aspect of it who are uh, terrible when uh, we have a 
gentleman in Michigan who's uh, building a uh, Rutan uh, uh, Long Easy, which is the airplane that John Denver met his demise in, and uh, he has a Corvair in it. And he said at family gatherings, he takes no end in pleasure of saying to the most squeamish people in the family, yes, I'm building a John Denver airplane with a Ralph Nader motor in it. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a really good way to filter out uh, people that are worth spending your time with uh, from, from people who are not. And, uh, and when you look at aviation and you look at Corvairs, uh, Ed Cole was a pilot. I think most of us know that. And it certainly influenced his thinking about things. Uh, and there were a lot of other guys. Uh, today I sat in John Glenn's car, uh, marvel marvelous restoration, uh, fantastic, now down at the uh, museum. Uh, you know, uh, John Glenn, obviously an aviator. I believe Don Yanko was a pilot also. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Uh, and, and there are a lot of people. If you, if you know a lot of uh, people of the last 50 years in aviation, they have a really very, very high uh, group of them were Corvair people. And it's not because it was an air-cooled car and airplanes are largely air-cooled. It goes back to that idea of if you choose to be a pilot, you are moving past the ridicule of what other people thought you should do with your life. And if you choose to fly the air, airplane of your choice or drive the car of your choice unconcerned by what other people think, you have a different quality of life than most people are willing to settle for. And that's the common connection between people who choose aviation and people who choose Corvairs. So uh, in conclusion, the one thing I want to share with you was uh, something I wrote about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, somebody was asking me uh, a, a particular question. And my response to them uh, was uh, the phrase, somebody said, what, you know, real freedom, you know, flying is uh, free. And I thought, uh, not really, not if you're still restrict restricted to the constraints of what other people think or care about, because that exists inside flying also. And it exi exists inside lots of uh, uh, aspects of our lives. And so I wrote down, I was supposed to write some large response for him. And the only thing I wrote down was real freedom is the sustained act of being an individual. So if I could leave you with anything, the phrase real freedom is the sustained act of being an individual. If you think back on our lives, uh, uh, most of us all have gray hair. And uh, as we look back on the things that we did that were important, and the things that we want to do with our time that are important, gatherings like this, sharing them, and having time with other people who are absolutely committed to being the individual that they choose to be in all pursuits of their life. I want to thank you for having me here this evening, and uh, I want to thank the people who put the event on that invited myself. Uh, have a nice evening.